Good afternoon. Welcome to Live at the Museum. My name is Penny and I work here at the National Museum in our lifelong learning team. And today I am once again joined by Adam Ship of Urabi Consultancies. Before we get underway today, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that we're filming on today, the Ngunnawal, Ngunnawal and Ngambri people of Canberra. I pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging and I would like to extend that respect to any and all First Nations people here present and joining us via the live stream. Which gives me a very nice segue to reintroduce you to Adam. Hi Adam, it's really nice to have you back here at Live at the Museum. Yeah, thanks Penny and um, you know I feel like a veteran now, I've done this a couple of times so I'm looking forward to uh, taking you on another journey through the forecourt and all the wonderful plants that are planted out here um, and sharing um, you know, our traditional knowledge um, with the audience here. So I hope you guys really enjoy it today. So uh, Adam joined us a couple of weeks ago on a very cold and blustery day uh, to take us through the garden and some of the things that are happening out there in winter. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to enter them in the live stream. We will get to them just after the tour. Thank you. Hello, I'm Adam Ship, proud Wiradjuri man, and today we're here at the National Museum of Australia in the beautiful Forecourt Gardens. I'd like to start by acknowledging the Ngunnawal, Ninawal and Ngambri people, whose beautiful country we're standing on today. We're here in the middle of cold winter in Canberra in August, so stay warm and come on a journey with me and learn about all these beautiful plants and how we have used them for thousands of years. So we have this lovely plant here. This is Coria, Coria alba, or the white Coria. It's a really beautiful plant. It actually grows to a shrub and quite a thick, dense shrub. So it is great to promote habitat for small animals and insects. When it is a shrub, a larger shrub, we can actually break the really nice woody branches off it and use it for thatching for our houses and, and um, things like that. But a really good useful thing from this plant are the leaves. We can collect the leaves, we can dry them out and then make a really yummy tea from them. The tea tastes a lot like English breakfast, I often call it curry breakfast. And if you want, you can even collect some of the beautiful little white flowers and add it to your cup for a little bit of extra sweetening. Here we have a Banksia. This one is a coastal one. It's Banksia spinulosa. We can see on these flowers, at the moment, they're quite fresh and ready to be picked and used. Now, there's a bit of an art to collecting them to get um, a heap of the nectar from them. And often you'll, you know, sort of try and follow the little pollinators, the bees and the native bees and the little insects that are going to them. And when you see them going to them, you know that they're rich in nectar and there's certain times of the day that they will go more frequently to them. And that's when we know to go and collect them as well. And we collect those fresh flowers, we don't take them all, we just take a few. And we soak them in a coolerman full of cold water. And what it produces is this really sweet drink. And the drink is almost banana flavour. It's really nice. But probably the most useful thing about the drink is it's a really good sustaining energy boost. The flower starts to dry off after a certain period, and then it um, provides other uses. So the middle of the flower can be used as a paintbrush, doing your dots and your lines and um, all your traditional art. So very useful for that. Also these dry little bristles can be used to start fire um, because they're quite flammable when dry. One plant again, many, many uses. So I'm sitting next to a lovely little Darwinia here, and this one is a lemon-scented Darwinia. And with many of our lemon-scented plants, uh, native plants, particularly the ones that like this have citrol in it, they're really, really useful as an insect repellent. So we can pick a little bit off, crush it up, rub it all over our skin, and this will help to keep the insects at bay for just a, for a couple of hours. And we can just keep picking it as needed and rubbing it in. But that scent and those oils 
will keep them at bay, and particularly um, the nasty ones like mosquitoes. Then you can grab more of the plant if, if you need it and chuck it into the campfire and the resulting smoke, particularly from a green plant like this, it will smoke out an area and it will protect the whole family from all those um, nasty biting insects. So it's a really good one to repel the insects and to be able to um, you know, sit comfortably in the bush. So here we got the grass tree, and this is such an important plant. It has so many cultural, um, spiritual significance to, to many Aboriginal people across Australia, and it has many, many uses. The leaves, to start with, we get lovely carbohydrates from the base of the leaf, and we can pull them up, we can eat the leaf, chew the leaf, we get lots of good sugars from it as well. Now on the trunks of the grass trees, we don't have a trunk here, this is only a small one, but on the trunks of the grass trees, they produce a lot of sap. And the sap is like this beautiful maroon um, colour that glistens in the sun. And what we do is we crush it up. Um, we use a bit of kangaroo poo. We use a few different things and we melt it in the fire, the sap, and mix it with all those other materials. And then basically it becomes like a cement. And so we bind our weapons and tools together with it and we still use it today. Um, we can patch up our, you know, our boomerangs when they crack and things, patch it up with that as well like a resin. So a really useful um, tool there. It gets a beautiful big spike on it and that big spike produces these lovely white flowers that, like many of these other plants I'm talking about, produce sweet nectar. And that nectar is soaked in water and we drink it. They then produce a seed later on, and those seeds can be ground up, made into flour for cooking to make bread and dampers. So here we are with a she-oak. She-oaks are really important trees as well. She-oaks are found up on the hill, and they produce a pod. Those pods have so many uses. One of those uses when you're walking up in the hills and you're not near a river or a creek is to chew on that pod to induce saliva and to keep your thirst at bay. Those pods can also be ground up and used as a medicine just to rub on your sore joints to ease the pain. They're also useful for the seed inside the pods as a food source, not only for us but for the black cockatoo as well. And then finally as a children's toy. Because they're quite large, they can be made into lots of different things, kind of like an action figure or a toy that you would think of today. They, you, they were used the same way. They also have lovely wood on them. It's really useful for making tools. One that comes to mind is clap sticks. The clap sticks have a really unique sound from the she-oak, really high-pitched, beautiful sound. And they're also really white, inside the wood, so it's, it's a light coloured wood, different to some of our eucalypts and things. Another tree that I could talk all day about, but they're just some of the uses of our she-oak. Well, thank you for coming on this journey with me today through the National Museum of Australia, the beautiful Four Court Gardens here. I hope you've enjoyed learning about all these wonderful plants and how my people have used them for thousands of years. Thanks again and enjoy your day. Go away you. It's uh, certainly a much nicer day today uh, than it was when we were filming a couple of weeks ago. Before we jump into the audience questions, Adam, can I ask, would planting something like the lemon scented Darwinia in my garden, would that keep bugs away? Yeah, so I think just the um, planting in itself uh, is likely probably not to keep the bugs. It will probably actually um, bring some of the insects in uh, with its flower and things. And that's the same as many of the plants that we have that deter insects. So it's the actual sort of um, physical process of either crushing and um, getting those oils out of the plant and rubbing it on or um, throwing it into the fire. Um, the, the actual processes that um, and then release those chemicals that will then keep the insects um, at bay, particularly the mosquitoes. So you have to actually process it first. 
Well, plant it near the barbecue area. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, so if I was going to plant one bush food plant, um, what would you recommend? So, you know, I'm a plant nerd, so I love all of them. Um, probably one that I can think of uh, that, you know, particularly for our, us Canberra um, people here, uh, local, can be grown anywhere, could be grown in a balcony, you know, on a um, high-rise building, um, in a pot. Um, bulbine lily, so sometimes gets referred to as bush leek or bush onion. It's a small growing plant. It has a beautiful little bulb um, that's in the soil that we can dig up, we can roast, um, and they're really, really tasty, really good bush tucker. Um, and they're quite regenerative, so we can harvest one of the bulbs and you know um, put the plant back and it will continue to grow. So it's a really good one. Oh, lovely. Beautiful. Um, and I know this one's going to be a bit tricky because I'm asking you to name a favourite plant. Do you have a favourite plant, Adam? Yeah, too many, unfortunately, Penny. I get this question a lot, but um, it's too hard to kind of nail it right down to one. But I guess one that's really um, close to my heart is the Currajong. Um, and the Currajong, you know, it's a beautiful tree. It is a local growing one too, but it is one that we find um, out on my country too, in Radri country, um, quite widespread. And so whenever I see the beautiful old trees, it kind of reminds me of, of my country as well. So um, that's probably one that's very close to my heart. The Currajongs are really lovely trees, aren't they? Oh, yeah. I'm familiar with them from um, the Mildura area where my grandparents used to live. Um, and finally, before we jump into the audience questions, how would you process the Banksia in order to make Yep. that energy drink you were talking about in the pre-record? Yeah, so like I mentioned, um, I guess in the old, the traditional way was um, soaking um, in a coolerman of, of, with water for a, a long period. Um, today what we can do and what's been very effective is I collect the flowers and I um, put them in a glass jar, mm -hmm. um, filled up with water, cover the flower completely with water and then just, um, you can put it, actually put it out in the sun for a little bit, um, for a few hours, and then um, bring it inside and just leave it overnight or to up, up to two days. Um, and after about two days, you get this beautiful sort of banana flavour um, to it. So it's really sweet, really yummy, and it gives you that really good energy. Um, are there any Banksias I should avoid doing that with? Yeah, so I... Um, there would be, there's, you know, and I can't talk about all the Banksias because I, don't, I only know the ones that I know. Um, so I guess for the, a helpful um, tip for us Canberran folk, um, the local Banksia, Banksia marginata, the silver Banksia, um, it's a good one to go to. It's completely safe. It's one that I've used um, lots and lots of times. And it's the one that we find mainly across the ACT. It's, the, it's basically the main um, Banksia here in the ACT. So, so that's a good one to, to go by and to start with. Okay, um, I have a question coming in from the studio, apparently. Uh, if you wanted to create a native garden, when is the best time to start doing this? So most gardeners and most people in general, you know, they start to get some beautiful sunny days like this and um, they want to get out and get about and get into the garden. And that is great. And if you're going to care for it and look after it and maintain it, um, you know, spring into summer is a great time to do it. However, um, I would generally suggest probably um, autumn. Autumn's a great time to try to sort of establish a native garden because if you do it sort of, you know, March, April, we still got lovely weather. Um, you know, you can get them kind of sort of semi-established in that warm weather. It'll sort of go through winter, they'll kind of lay dormant a little bit, and then by spring, they've been in long enough that, you know, they get got their roots in, a little bit established, they'll get this beautiful flush um, of spring growth. And you're gonna notice that at the summer period, then you're not gonna have to be watering them as much because they've kind of, you know, had the whole year to get established. Um, so, you know, even with our local native plants, um, if you're gonna plant them, you know, late spring, you're gonna need to water them initially quite a bit over summer just to keep them alive and keep them thriving. So that's a good tip, I think, from, from my end. So. Thank you yep. so much. I have a question coming in from Caroline. Why should we plant indigenous plants in our home gardens? So, you know, I, I think obviously having the plants that are native to this area and this region, it, you know, it's um, a, a no-brainer. We should have them and we should be celebrating them and, you know, bringing them back across our landscape and our urban landscapes as well. Um, and we're starting to see that quite a bit. Um, and you're going to see that, you know, yes, 
all these plants take a little bit of time to get established, but once established, you know, our native species, they're pretty much very low maintenance. They look after themselves, they will live on rainwater, basically, um, and even through drought, some of them might suffer a little bit, but they bounce back. Um, you know, all my plants in my garden, you know, they suffered a little bit over the drought, um, period, but now they're looking beautiful and lush again, you know, and um, so I think it's really a no-brainer um, to be starting to plant our native plants. Um, also, you're going to bring in our native wildlife and bring our native wildlife back to the suburbs, so it's really important for that as well. Beautiful. So. Thank you so much. Uh, and Cynthia, following on from that question actually, would like to know, um, uh, is looking after native Australian plants low maintenance? Yeah, so um, again, it depends on the plant. Um, some plants might require a little bit more care and a little bit more attention. Other plants, it's pretty much, you know, you whack them in the ground, um, you give them a couple of good waters and then you leave and set and forget basically. So it is really dependent on the species. So I can't just say um, overall, like it's all low maintenance, but generally probably about 70% of the plants that you plant um, in your native garden is going to be, yeah, very, very easy to care for. So. Lovely. Well, yeah, Australia's a pretty big continent, so That's not right. everything's going to fit everywhere. Exactly. <laughs> Yellow Bird would like to know, what plants are good to put in our local gardens now with so much of Nemagi being burnt? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. So um, I think for local gardens, um, probably start with more of the shrub and the ground cover sort of plants, um, you know, the things that are going to flower, the things that are going to have fruits. So there are plenty of like local native um, plants that produce fruit. And so, you know, we've got to think Namaji, like it was, it's a huge food source for a lot of those animals out there. And obviously we're not going to draw all of them into town, but a lot of the birds and the things are, um, you know, they're really dependent on the fruits and the plants out there to survive. So if we start to plant some of our um, fruiting plants across our suburbs that are near Namaji and things, um, they'll come in and at least they'll have something to eat. Um, and even a lot of our plants that have edible seeds as well. So two things that I can think of off, off the bat, um, casuarinas. Now if you've got the space, you can plant them. They're, they grow into a larger tree, but all the seeds, um, most birds will eat them. So it brings in food for them. And you know, a kangaroo apple. A kangaroo apple has fruits and um, different sort of animals will graze on those as well. So, yeah. They're quite pretty too, the kangaroo yeah. apple, aren't they? Yeah. Uh, Caroline, another question, clearly very keen, uh, has heard that quite a few native plants rely on fire to seed and be maintained. Can she still have these plants in her garden? Yeah, so um, that is a really good question. Look, fire is um, a really important tool um, and a really important traditionally um, with the way that country was really um, managed, you know, and the plants really thrive from the right type of fire. Um, so I guess in a garden setting, some of the things you can do is like, so say, for example, some of the grasses, you can um, give them a good trim back, you know, um, at certain times of the year, maybe around autumn and things like that. And that will kind of, um, you know, a little bit like what a fire would go through, you know, you're sort of giving it a trim back to give it some nice new fresh growth to come out, come up. Um, if you don't want to put fire in your plants at home, um, I understand that too. Um, even, you know, if you guys have a little fireplace at home, you might be sitting around in winter and, you know, having a cuppa or whatever, save the ash and chuck the actual ash from the fire in your beds um, around the native plants because ash is a big part of it as well. The ash beds, that um, from the traditional um, land management through fire, um, the ash beds actually created lots of nutrients for the plants. So a lot of the native plants really like the nutrients that um, the ash um, draws in, into the earth. So yeah, so there's a few few tips there that you can kind of do at home. Beautiful, thank you so much. Uh, following on, another fire question. This one's from Christine. Uh, a lot of native plants have evolved to respond to being burnt, um, as we just mentioned. She wants to know if there are any in particular that are fire retardant. Yes. So there are, and um, you know, traditionally there are, um, it's actually sort of known as some plants are like um, fire plants and some plants are water plants and, and even ice plants and things like that. And that was um, one of the ways that they were kind of categorized in a sense um, in traditional terms. So. One plant that comes to mind and, you know, with the really fierce fires that we're seeing, um, they're probably still affected, but 
what, the one I mentioned before, the Kurrajong. So the Kurrajong is a water tree, basically. And um, you know, you look at the Kurrajong leaves, they're really glossy, they're really fresh, um, they hold a lot of water. And um, also underground, they give a lot of water out to the other plants and things. So they're just sitting, basically, and just um, big water trees, basically, holding water. And so the light fires and the fires um, around will basically go around them. They won't sort of touch them because they've got so much moisture um, in them. So they're a really good one to, to have around. So. We're uh, going from fire to frost. Grace would like to know, uh, are most native plants frost resistant? Will they survive Canberra's chilly winter mornings? <laughs> yeah, so, you know, we've got to think a little bit about it. So I, if we um, decide to grow, say, you know, a beautiful tropical plant from up uh, north Queensland and we try to bring it down here into our frost, you know, so rainforest country up there or something down into our frost, it's not going to do too well. Um, one that I can think of off the bat, lemon myrtle. Everyone wants lemon myrtle, you know, it's a beautiful plant. But in Canberra, it's really, um, it can be difficult to grow um, until it gets a bit more established. So um, I even suggest to some people that have lemon myrtles in a pot to bring it in in winter and have it near a sunny spot and things and actually keep it that protected. Um, so that to, to, I guess, get around the frost thing as local as possible or Think of areas, you know, say you want like a salt bush or something that might be in a bit more arid country. We'll look at um, how their sort of winter is out there. And if they get sort of um, similar frost, it's probably going to do all right here as well. So you really need to know the plant selection in Canberra because it's we have some pretty um, insane climates. So, yeah. yeah, we've got um, a big change between 40 degree summers and minus 10 overnight in winter. <laughs> uh, David S. Hi, David. It's nice to hear from you again. I haven't uh, anchored one of these for a while, so it's nice to see that you're still watching. Uh, would like to know, can you recommend any bush tucker plants that are indigenous to the Illawarra or Shoalhaven areas? Right, okay. So there are a few. Um, in our last video, we touched on one that um, is definitely up there. It's the Austral Bugle, which is one of the medicine plants, and that grows in that region. One thing that came straight to mind when I saw that question um, that you could definitely look at is the black apple. The, and, and that's a really beautiful one. It, it gets beautiful fruits as well. Um, and I believe it is in that region um, and really does like the more coastal regions um, right up um, to, the, to Queensland, basically, New South Wales and up to Queensland. And that's a beautiful bush fruit. Um, and so, yeah, maybe the, the um, native black apple would be a really good one to start with. So. Uh, we're coming to the end of our program. We do have time for a few more questions. Uh, if we don't get to your question, don't worry, we will respond in text in the public comments below. Uh, the on-site audience has a question and they would like to know what native plants have strong scents? Well, <laughs> I mean, where do I start? There are so many um, out there. So, um, you know, it's, it's a really interesting one. One that I guess um, comes to mind here locally um, we have a plant called Cassinia, and it's sometimes um, referred to as cauliflower bush. And it has these flowers that actually look like a cauliflower, um, and it has lots of edible parts as well. But um, if you go close to it, you'll smell it. But as soon as you squish it, it's just this an amazing aroma of kind of curry and rosemary. It's got this really interesting smell to it. But yeah, you know, I could be here all day listing the really lovely scented plants. There's so much, many out there, but that's one that comes to mind um, locally. So. All right. Uh, Kay Bal would like to know what are the best native plants to attract very small native birds? Very small native birds, yeah, yeah. So the thing with very small native birds, um, you need to kind of create a habitat where they can kind of go into and be protected from the larger birds. So. Often, um, even things like the banksias, like will bring in the larger birds. So um, even though they kind of get bigger, and you'd think that they would um, protect the little ones, the big currawongs and the you know the bigger birds will come in looking, seeking the flowers and things. Um, so some of the like prickly, spiky native plants are really, really good because um, they kind of you know. Um, almost create like a forge or fortress for the little birds to kind of hide in and they're really prickly and they deter um, other bigger birds and other animals. So a couple that comes to mind, native raspberry, 
quite a prickly one. Um, and also um, the native blackthorn or the Bessaria. So they're really good sort of habitat plants to have that are spiky and little birds will like to sort of um, get in underneath them and be a bit protected. Uh, we've got a question from Facebook. Uh, what native plants would you suggest for a hedge uh, and three metres tall? That's wow. a very specific question. So that one that we mentioned, the one that I um, talked about with the tea, the Coria, mm -hmm. can hedge really, really well. Um, obviously, you would have to physically hedge it a little bit yourself because it will go a bit sprawly and things, but if you hedge it, it will come um, together really well and, and um, hedge out really, really nicely. Another one that I'm actually really um, interested in looking at now is slow growing, but it actually has a lot of potential in hedging is our bush pepper, our native pepper. So, um, you know, a lot of people think, oh, and, and it's true, like they do like a bit of shade, um, but they're showing a lot of, um, you know, potential there to actually hedge and be a hedging plant. And they're a beautiful bush tucker. You can get fruit, leaves, it's all edible as well. So, um, so yeah, there's a couple anyway um, for the Canberra region. So yeah. The um, bush pepper's pretty fiery, isn't it? It is fiery, yeah. It'll it's clean got your sinuses it. out. It's yeah. quite tasty. Yeah. Uh, Nick would like to know, is kangaroo paw good to grow in Canberra? The kangaroo paw is a beautiful um, plant and obviously a Western Australian plant. So in Canberra, they can grow and they can, um, I've seen some really um, good, you know, um, specimens of kangaroo paw, um, but they do take a little bit of care. So often what I say for people with kangaroo paws is um, in a pot, um, you know, you do want, they like sun um, and things. In winter, they'll get um, a bit of the, some black spot and a bit of like sort of fungi stuff on the leaves sometimes because of our really cold winters compared to uh, what they get, get over in WA where they're naturally from. So um, what you do there is you actually trim them right down in winter, um, basically right back, and then in spring they'll come back with a new flush and things. So. Uh, we have a question from our on-site audience. Uh, can you recommend any resources to find out more? Yeah, so um, for the ACT and the region, um, the one that comes to mind straight away is the Nungawal Plant Use Guide. Um, so that's available e at the Botanic Gardens, it's available online, you can buy it online, you can buy it uh, at the Arboretum. Lots of places sell it, um, the Nungawal Plant Use Guide. Um, so if you just Google that, um, it'll come up. And a lot of the plants I've mentioned are in that booklet. Um, for, you know, my mobile Wiradjuri, we've got a Wiradjuri plant use guide. There's lots of different, uh, I guess, areas where you are that have books and stuff to kind of introduce you to um, the native um, plants and their uses. So, um, We'll pop a couple of links to those sorts of things in the comments as well so that you can come back to them and find them easily for those of you who are watching online. We have the final question coming in now. It's from our on-site audience uh, and they'd like to know what are some fast growing native plants? So probably um, the quickest sort of growing plants, the ones that are kind of, they're called colonizing plants. Um, so wattles. So if you've got the space for a wattle, because you know, you've got to think some wattles will get to 10, 15 metres high, but they will grow like a couple metres in a year. Um, they grow really quick, they get established really quick. And they're really good because they put nitrogen into the soil and they actually help other plants around them to grow. So they're a good colonising plant. If you haven't got a lot of space, I mean, you still need a bit of space for this one, but the one I mentioned before, Penny, was the kangaroo apple. Um, that's really fast growing because it's actually a shorter living plant. So when I say that, it probably lives about five to seven years you'll get out of it. Um, but within the first season, it shoots up and it's um, creating fruit like already within the first season. So that's another one. Um, and then probably, you know, like our more common landscape ones like Lamandras um, and Hardenbergies and stuff, they grow fairly quick um, once you get them in a good spot and get them a little bit established. Beautiful. All right, uh, before we wrap up, um, I have one last question for you. I'm a great big tea drinker. So how much coria do I need per cup of tea? Yeah, so when you dry the coria leaf out, um, you know, like you can imagine like a dry loose leaf tea, probably around one to two teaspoons um, is fine. I find that the fresh leaf is quite strong. So you probably only need like 
five leaves to a cup, really, like, and you'll get quite a strong English breakfast tasting tea. Um, but yeah, that's kind of a good guide, one to two teaspoons of dried herb or five, six leaves in a cup, um, fresh off the bush, so yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, so uh, please do, uh, thank you everybody for joining us. Sorry, I'm just having a slight moment. Uh, Adam will also be on site for a spring forecourt garden tour on the 31st of October, is that right Adam? Yep, that's, that's at 10 a.m. Yep. Uh, booking details are on the museum's website. Uh, so Live at the Museum is now going to a monthly program and the next one will be on Thursday the 24th of September again at 12.30. This program is called After the Flames, Fire and Conservation with Libby, who's one of our curators, and a conservator, Natalie Eisen. So thank you all very much for joining us today at Live at the Museum. It's been wonderful fielding all of your questions. They are fabulous as always. And I would like to thank Adam once again for joining us. And hopefully we'll see you all next month. Thanks, Great, Adam. thanks, Penny. Thank you all.